Under the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Wetlands Protection Act, and Chapter 26 of the Town of Danvers General Bylaw, the Wetlands Protection Bylaw. Uh, after each applicant presents his or her request and the board has had time to ask questions and discuss the project, we will accept questions from the audience. Because this is a public meeting, it is required by law that you give your name and address first. Um, given that this is um, an online meeting, there's a, a special uh, statement I need to read before we begin, so that's what I'm going to do right now. Uh, good evening. This open meeting of the Danvers Conservation Commission is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirements of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted on the town. This is the order which you can find posted on the town's website. Allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded, so that the public can follow along with the deliberation of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such partic participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting of the Conservation Commission. Um, we are convening remotely via the WebEx, WebEx app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take, take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you, that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Um, supporting materials have been provided by members of the members of this body and will be shown during the transmission. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. Uh, we are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for the effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate in meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment questions or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. For items with public comment, we have established an email address for public comments, which is publiccomments at danversmass.gov. This email address is shown online with the streaming of this meeting. Residents may email comments, and they will be provided and read out loud after the staff has confirmed the name and address. All email must contain the date and the phrase Conservation Commission in the subject line. We have also established a phone line for public comment. You may call 978-777-0001, extension 2, to provide comment. Finally, each vote to end this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. All right, uh, moving forward, we'll uh, start with the roll call. Uh, Peter Wilson is present. Vanessa Curran. Present. Chelsea King. Present. Uh, Ann McGill. Present. Uh, Joseph O'Donnell is not. Uh, Mike Splain. And Ken Wally. I thought I saw Ken's name earlier. Okay, so we have more members. Is that correct, Georgia? Sorry, I was muted. Um, and we got Vanessa too, correct? Right. So we have, yep, we, have, four. We, have, we have four members. Yep, you're good to go. Ken's on. No, uh, I, he, he, I can see him because I'm looking in gallery view. So Ken's on, but I think he was on mute when he was trying to say hi. Okay. Yeah, I did just see him. Hi, Ken. Yep. 
I spoke to him earlier. He's here. So with Mike being absent, uh, is Ken a voting member now? Uh, no, Ken would be a voting member if the quorum needed to be established. So, but we have four full members, so Ken's more than welcome to participate, but the vote will be fully met with the four members we have. Okay. He can ask questions, though, and, and make comments. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, the first order on our agenda is request for determination of applicability for 35 Coolidge Road, RBA number 202. And who's here to represent the applicant? Jeannie Pelazola. Hi, Jean. How are you? Um, okay, could you give us an overview of what you're proposing? Sure. Uh, do you want to look at the plot plan or just give give you a brief description? So, Jean, uh, why don't you pull up the plan? Uh, okay. Jean, going to share the plot plan that plot plan. in the back. Okay. Can you all view that? Yes. Okay. Uh, so what I would like to do, or you can see on the map here where my proposed addition is. Um, so my 100 foot buffer is up here uh, and my 50 foot buffer zone um, goes into the proposed addition by about four feet. Um, in addition to the proposed uh, addition right here, uh, there's concrete and there are, there's patio paper that's right here that I'm assuming, um, you know, as they do the construction, uh, this is going to get either cut into or, you know, disrupted. So uh, I would like to as well either re-concrete this area and re-paver um, this area at the very least. Okay. Um, any additional information that just for my plans which that you need or? Uh, uh, just probably a question for Georgia. This is all with the, with could be considered minor work, right? Because it's in, well, it's a little um, outside of the 50 foot. Yeah, so I'm happy to walk through that quickly. Um, <clears throat> so on the bottom of Gene's screen, you'll see where it says top of bank. So the top of bank in this case has the 100 foot buffer zone, which you see um, at the other top of the screen. So in order for the proposed addition to meet the minor activity under the act, it needs to meet those four performance standards um, that we had discussed. So one of those is that it must be entirely within the 100 foot buffer. Um, the other one is that erosion controls must be provided. The other one is that um, disturbed areas are loam and seeded. And that, um, and the fourth one is that all activity is at least 50 feet away um, from the resource area. And in this case, uh, Gene has mentioned, it's about four feet um, into that 50 foot buffer. Um, but again, those performance standards are up to the discretion of the board. So if you guys right. wanted to discuss um, further. But it looks like that the, the paver patio work is going to be even, well, maybe not so much. I guess it's probably within 40, 50 feet. It's just, you know, the 50 foot line kind of has a wave to it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So um, right now the paver work would be outside of the 35 um, foot zone, but um, again, I'm assuming if they're going to be digging this area up, then this is probably going to get disrupted. And at that point, um, I, I would think at the very least I would have to replace what's close to the addition. Right. Um, just lost my train of thought. Now, how about the other half with the? Uh, wanting to do work on the, the pool uh, patio. So on the, the concrete deck of the pool, is that what you mean, this area right here? Right. So that is something um, that I'm thinking within the next five years, I may have to do something with because um, in some areas of the pool, the pool was built in 1984. And I'm assuming that's the original pool deck. And, um, you know, it's, it's held up pretty well, but in some spots, 
it looks like the coping is starting to pull away from the concrete deck. So um, I'm thinking in the near future that will have to be done. I, I don't, I guess, I don't need a decision on that, but um, I, I guess I would like to know what my options, if I were to just say replace what's already existing, like stay in the same footprint, if that is something that I would be able to do. Uh, I mean, we would have the vote on this, obviously, but I would think that if we did this work on the, um, the pool patio, I mean, most of it is within the 25-foot no disturb zone. So, uh, I mean, that would, you know, we'd want to have a pretty, you know, good control of that. So I, I, I would think that we would want to uh, have you have an order of conditions. Uh, and the other is minor work, right? So that's, I mean, that's up to our discretion in, uh, you know, it's close in, in the wet the, the wetlands Georgia is an intermittent stream is that right uh, correct so it's an intermittent stream um, and where it says top of bank that's actually where you're measuring that hundred foot so the stream is actually may even be off site right. um, yeah so the, the streams much further down well further down here you know right. this is the top of the area now, is that pretty much just drainage for Cabot Road um, essentially, and it feeds off into or off of Frostfish Brook, so it's really it's a hydrologic connection, but it's a stormwater control too. So, but right. it does it does provide resource habitat and is classified. Right. And what what is at the top of the bank? Is there a fence or anything there? Right along here is a fence. Okay. All right. So there's a nice little border. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions that I have. So let me uh, just. Um, We'll go through the board and let them uh, see if they have any other questions. First, I'll ask is Chelsea. Do you have any questions or comments, Chelsea? Um, first of all, what kind of pavers are being used for that patio? Can we get them to be permeable? Um, I'm not sure what pavers would be considered permeable. Like I think there's a couple different brands. Um, Anything that allows water to flow through? I think, well, you know, I it, think would, it would flow through. The, the smaller the stone, the better. It's just going to oh. allow that much more uh, runoff. Okay. Um, I guess if you want to give me some guidance of what would, you know, what my options would or should be, um, I I was not thinking of a smaller paver, but if um, that's the route that I would have to go, then I would go that route. What is there now? Right now it's like a 12 by 12 inch paver. Okay. So uh, it's a, you know, it's bigger than that, but it still allows for drainage in that whole area, in that area. Right. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Hi, sorry, this is David. I don't mean to jump in. Um, I was just going to say with the pavers as well, it, it, um, it could simply depend on the installation doesn't necessarily mean an all, altogether different type of paver. So if the joints between the pavers are filled with stone chip or a different variety to allow the water to go through, that might be right. um, an easier fix if that's the case. But just to throw that out there. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Dave. Okay, uh, Chelsea, any further questions? Um, I guess my only thing is so like, even though the uh, pool patio, the concrete goes into the 25 foot. Um, I don't know, would it be a huge concern because she would be just like repaving an area that's already disturbed? Kind of like when we've had cases of like uh, lawns that went out well into the 25 foot area and we kind of allowed that. Like this area is already paved, so would digging it up and repaving it like be a big enough issue to consider like an order of conditions? Are you asking Jean? I'm, or I'm asking, asking just in general. That's my only thought with this. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. My, my viewpoint is anything within that 25 zone, we really have to protect the, the, uh, the wetlands. Just we don't want them disturbed. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, since this has been, been here since probably prior to any uh, wetlands bylaws, I mean, it's there. And, you know, if it needs to be replaced and re or repaired or replaced, that 
you know, we, we should work with the applicant to, to make that work. But on the other hand, we also have to uh, safeguard the, the wetlands. Right. Um, so, so if I did want to go further with that concrete decking of the pool, even, even the portion that's in the 25 foot zone, what additional steps would I need to, are these, are these things that I could just do on my own? Are you telling me that I would have to have somebody come in and, um, do like a, like a wetland scientist come in or would I just have to take precautions, do certain things so that the replacement would not disrupt anything? I would say we, we would definitely, regardless of what's going on, we would say we want erosion control along that fence. Um, if you were to expand that paved area, I think at that point I would want an order of conditions, but if you're just like repaving what's already there, I'm kind of on the fence of saying it's not enough to warrant, in my opinion, an order mm -hmm. of conditions, as long as we can just say like, you know. Right. Um, yeah. Right. I'd be 100% okay with that. Okay. Um, then, yeah, I think that would be our main concern is just like don't expand further and make sure we have erosion control in place. Right. Which we can uh, include that as kind of like a stipulation without doing a full order of conditions, I believe. So. Sure. Okay. Right. Um, that's my understanding, at least, and those are my thoughts on it. I'll open the board up so like the other members. Okay. okay. There's a question to follow up on that, Georgia. Is that the true that uh, we, I think we've done this in the past, we've, we've more or less had conditions attached to a negative RDA? Correct. Yeah. We have, and I would say usually they always correlate with the performance standards. So that's like erosion control and stockpiling. Um, those are typical, it's, it's not a ton, it's usually one, one to four conditions, but yes. Okay, so we've done that. Okay. Um, Okay, um, who's next? Anne. Um, the existing fence uh, that she's adding um, runoff control and will uh, that make a difference if the um, concrete needs to be um, attended to for repair purposes facing that brook section there? Because the number four was in the proposal here. They, they were going to add fencing and silk stock to hold any any movement above that. Would that be sufficient for what Chelsea was referring to as a mi as a minor condition here? I think the minor conditions is just the work that's being done with the addition and on the okay. the northern side of the pool. All right. Uh, the the patio work on the, the southern side is, uh, uh, you know, it's more problematic for us because it's within the twenty five foot no disturbance. Okay. Zone. Okay. Um, if it was just repair work on the twenty five rather than replacement, does that make a difference? Would that make a difference for her? Jean, is that what you're proposing to repair or to replace? Um, I I would have to probably have somebody come in and um, find out what my options would be for a repair, I guess. Um, and I have I have not done that. So, and my and my thought was probably that I would replace it. Um, but I I can look more into um, what repair work would entail, and maybe not have to do a full dig up, but I might have to do a full, they may look at it and see, okay, this has been here for almost 30 years. You know, it's not worth salvaging and the, probably the best thing to do would be just repair what's existing, you know, staying in that footprint. Um, but I have not spoken to anyone about that yet. So. Okay. If, okay. if you're telling me that, if you're telling me that the only the the safest thing that you feel comfortable with would be to repair then i would i would try to work around that um or i would i wouldn't do anything to it probably i would just you know i over over time there there are going to be issues i guess okay okay, okay. 
But I guess I just work with you on whatever you told me is what how is how we go. Once we get through everyone's comments, we'll we'll kind of discuss it and give you some options. Okay. Um, uh, anything else, Ann? No, that was I'm just looking at it as another thought. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vanessa. Um, I agree with you, Peter, that I I think the, the addition portion of the work and the concrete slab that's adjacent to the house, um, I see that work as pretty minor, and I feel like finding a, a negative determination on that seems fairly reasonable, but I do also agree with you about the concrete all the way around the pool. Um, just getting into that 25-foot no disturb, um, I'm not sure that we can do the RDA on that. We, it's possible that we might need to do a full NOI on that one, the notice right. of intent, just because it is getting, again, very close to the resource area compared to where the addition is. Okay. Anything else, Vanessa? Um, no, that's all I have right now. And it, I think um, in terms of, well, I guess in terms of repair versus, versus replacing, you know, there's too much unknown at this point to know which one it's going to be without having had a contract to right. look at. Right. That's, yeah, that's the homeowner's call more than ours. Yeah. I mean, if you feel a repair would not, um, would not, um, be as or uh, i'm sorry but when you are you are referring to something that would need to be done if it was within the 25 foot and i'm not sure what that it was some term terminology oh, sorry the noi is the notice of intent so that's kind oh. of the next, the next level of um you know putting in a, a fuller application okay for, um, and, for order of conditions which is, and then you might need professional help with that if i did the noi right Okay, all right. And you would feel that would be the case um, whether whether it was a replace and or a repair or just a replace? Uh, Honestly, it's, not, it's kind of hard to say without knowing the scope of the work. Right. But, yeah, I would say you know, more than likely a replace would definitely be an NOI type of situation. In a repair, like Vanessa just said, we probably would want to get a better idea what's actually going to be done. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Vanessa, you all set? Yes. Okay. How about Ken? Do you have any questions? Um, I would think that if she were to replace the fence, that it would be aesthetically more pleasing than, than a repair. The fence or the deck? Did I lose you? Did I lose you? Did I lose you? Georgia, I'm seeing a nice conference. Georgia? Georgia? Yeah, I'm not sure what's happening with Ken because we have him on his computer and his phone audio, so that's why we're getting yeah. back. Yeah. It's very echoey, but it's the call-in user is Joe. Or Ken, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So, Ken, I think you have your audio also playing on your phone, so you're going to have to, I think we're going to need double feedback on you. It went away. Ken, can you try saying something now? Is, is that better now? That's yes. so much better. Okay. Go, you can proceed well, from where you are. But for some reason, I keep losing you. Uh, um, I, maybe my internet's not strong enough or something, something wrong. But uh, what I had said was that the replacement of a fence would be more aesthetically pleasing and would look better in the neighborhood. Uh, is replacing a fence part of the, the, the project? No. It's not, right? It is so not. That, it, it doesn't matter then. Right. Yeah, and, and the fence is even farther out into the 25, so. Okay. Uh, 
Any other questions, Joe? Well, I'm sorry, that's it. Ten. Okay. Uh, not sure. Dean, I, I, I'm just going to put it out there, and the other members of the board, I'm going to call them to see if they uh, agree with me. Uh, Ken, could you mute yours, your, your your phone, please, or your microphone? Um, I'm going I'm to recommend Gene, and I'm going to poll the other members to see if they agree. I would suggest that you move ahead with the, the bedroom addition and you know whatever work has to be done on the patio. Okay. It would fall under the the minor um, work. Yep. And then down the road, if you decide that this pool needs some further repair, then you would have to get you know whatever help you need to um, get an NOI drawn up. Is that you know in good conscience we can't uh, do an NDI for work that's you know well within the 25 uh, buffer zone. Okay. That's, uh, so does that sound okay to you? I mean, I'd rather you it was okay, but I understand what what you're saying, and and if that's your decision, that that's fine. Yeah, that's well, that's pretty much what we're that's our our mission. We've got to protect the wetlands. All right, yep. so I'm just going to go uh, through the, the group and see if they agree with that, and then we'll we'll go uh, with the motion. Uh, so Chelsea, do you agree, or do you have further comment? Um, I can agree with that. Yeah, just treat the the patio addition as uh, its own thing, and then for anything further down than that, like on the pool area, that would be a separate issue. I'd be fine with that. Okay, Ann. Um, yes, I support your motion there. Okay, uh, Vanessa. I agree. Um, I just think without really knowing the scope of work on the replacement or repair of the concrete around the pool, if it ends up not being able to be repaired and it ends up being this huge job, I don't want it to have. You know, we shouldn't have said that was okay under a negative right. determination. So I do yes. think, and it's entirely possible that if it can be repaired and you come back and the work is minor, we might find another negative determination somewhere down the line. But I just don't think we have nearly enough information right now to decide. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ken, do you have any further comment or? Uh, okay, I guess I did. Ken, you there? I agree with the rest of the board. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so uh, can we someone make a motion that um, uh, we grant a negative determination of applicability? And uh, there was a couple conditions that uh, we did want to attach to that. Okay. And we need a volunteer. Can you remind me of what all the conditions are? I don't mind making a motion, but I'm. It was pretty much just the uh, the erosion control, and I think we should have something in there about any construction uh, debris has to be stored outside of the 50, of the fifty foot uh, buffer line, preferably taken off site. Okay. All right. In that case, then I will um, make a motion that we grant a negative determination of applicability for the construction of an addition and repair of a possible repair of a concrete slab and paver patio um, outside the 35 foot no construction zone um, that with special conditions of um, making sure there's sufficient erosion control to protect the wetlands and then also any construction debris must either be stored outside of the 50 foot buffer or trucked up site. And oh, the RDA number is 2020-04. Uh, okay. Uh, is Georgia, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, were there any other special conditions that uh, we, we mentioned? Uh, no, as long, it, those covered the ones in the performance standards. Okay. Uh, so the motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, uh, we'll go through the roll call vote. Um, Vanessa? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Ann? Yes. And Peter Wilson? Yes. 
Okay, so uh, you're all set, Dean. Good luck. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, and we'll probably see you again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, next up is item D, request for a permit extension at 130 Center Street. Uh, who's here to represent the applicant? Uh, <clears throat> Tanya Hartford. Hi, Tanya. Hello. I'm here representing RCG uh, Wadsworth Village. Uh, we own 130 Center Street, known as Wadsworth Village. Uh, we were granted um, an order of conditions uh, about three years ago for the construction of three new buildings at the property. Um, one of those three buildings was within the 100-foot buffer zone. We have not been able to start construction on that. We've been delayed. Uh, we did get an ex a two-year extension on our site plan review permit, which will expire next summer. And so um, I'm asking for a one-year extension on our order of conditions in the hopes that we can move ahead with construction on this project in the next you know, six months, six to nine months. And, um, and we would, the way that the construction and the sequencing would go with these buildings is we would be doing the site work and finishing that building that's within that 100-foot buffer zone first. That would be that first project. Um, so we would be able to close that out. So even if we're not we're done with construction with all three buildings, we would be able to finish the one that's within that 100-foot buffer zone within a one-year time frame. Okay, and all the, the plans are remaining the same, no, no changes? There's no changes at all at this point, no. Mm -mm. Uh, so where we would come back to the board. Oh. And what, uh, what's the magnitude of the work that needs to be done within the 100-foot uh, jurisdiction line? Is there a lot? Um, there is, um, I have the, I don't know if you can see my, I don't know how to share my screen. The plans, I don't, if you want to look at them. But essentially it would be, um, there's some limited site work um, so a foundation of a building, the corner of the foundation of a building. Okay, because just, you're just aware that if we grant this extension, yep. that you have, uh, well, your, your original order runs out in August sometime, right? And then uh, another 12 months after that, you would have to have all of the work relevant to that order of conditions completed by, uh, That's by right. the end of that year, next August. Otherwise, you have to come back and go through the whole NOI process again. Right. And I think that from my perspective, um, I think that either we're going to be, be able to do it or we're going to decide not to move ahead with the project at this point. We would have to file a new NOI anyway. So okay. I, I would like the opportunity for the board to give us that extension so that we can at least not have to do a new NOI at this point, but that we could um, get that one-year extension and hopefully get it done. Um, and if not, then we would be coming back to you with a new NOI and project. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, that's pretty much all I have. So let me just uh, pull the members to see if there's any other comments or questions. Um, Chelsea, do you have any questions? Uh, Ann. No, I'm good with this one. Okay. Um, Vanessa. Um, I wouldn't mind if we could just look at the plans really quick. So um, Ms. Hartford, if you, do you see all the really, buttons at the bottom that say like mute and stop my video? There's one that's like a box with an arrow pointing out that will share yep. your screen. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Oh, yes. Good job. So can you just kind of walk us through what we're looking at here? Is that sharing with you all? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Also so, um, okay, so I zoomed it in over here so you can kind of see the only building that's going in there. This is there's another new building here and another new building here. And this is that this is the only one that's within that buffer zone. Okay, so there'd be foundation work and all that. But that's this has all been spelled out already in the original order of conditions, right? Correct. Okay. Everything is spelled out. Yep. All right, Vanessa, I, I took over your, your floor time, so I'll give it back. Oh, that's fine. I just, it was just good to hang a frame of reference just to kind of see what we were looking at. Okay, any other questions? Vanessa, you all set? 
All set. Okay. And Ken, do you have any questions? I don't know if we lost him. Uh, okay. Uh, I, unless anyone has strong objections or is there any comment from the public, uh, we'd, we'd listen to those now. Hi, Peter. This is David here. Uh, no emails. Okay. And Alicia, any phone calls? There's no phone calls. Okay. Uh, all right. I'd, I'd entertain a motion that we extend uh, the order of conditions. I uh, use someone to make that motion. I'll make the motion. Um, I'll make a motion to extend the order of conditions by one year for the 130 Center Street uh, project, DEP file number 14-1298. Okay, the motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. I think that was a second. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Vanessa? Yes. Chelsea? Did that go through? I heard. Uh, I said yes. 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 Okay. Yep. All right. uh, Anne. Yes. And Peter. Yes. Okay. So you have a one year extension. Excellent. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. On to item C 160 Andover Street. Uh, the applicant is Brian Levy. Uh, is, is Brian here? Yes. Okay, Brian, if you could just talk us through what you're proposing and we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Levy. I'm the law firm of Beverage and Diamond. I represent uh, PMG, Petroleum Management Group. Um, we have uh, on the line with me tonight our uh, project engineer, Jesse Coakley, and our uh, wetlands consultant, um, Ray Walker. And uh, I wanted to thank the uh, commission for uh, listening to us tonight on this informal basis um, as my client sort of uh, assesses uh, going forward with this um, project. Um, you're probably familiar with the location, 160 Andover Street, which is very close to the junctions of uh, Route 95 and 114 and um, uh, Route 1 and 114. It's a, a high traffic uh, commercial um, area. Uh, back in 1962, the site was first redeveloped um, as a gas station. Uh, and then again, uh, in 1984, um, there was a complete uh, teardown rebuild of yet another gas station. Uh, and then in 2006, History repeated itself. There was another teardown and reconstruction of a gas station, and that was by uh, Cumberland Farms. So the site has been uh, redeveloped um, three times. Um, focusing on uh, 2006 and the, the Cumberland Farms project, Cumberland got uh, a use variance and, and numerous dimensional variances from the zoning board to basically rebuild the site and the Conservation Commission granted an order of conditions uh, under the state uh, regs and your local uh, bylaw. And the, 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 the sort of the, the, the main point of the uh, order of condition was that the site was largely in a riverfront, uh, about 45,000 square feet, I'm gonna use all round numbers here, uh, a riverfront area on the site and about 37,000 square feet of which um, was classified as degraded and was altered. Now, under the river, riverfront regulations, um, uh, you're allowed to, do, to redevelop uh, what's been degraded. Um, so essentially there was another 8,000 square feet plus or minus that was not um, redeveloped, which, which could have been. So jumping forward now uh, to 2016, uh, Blue Hill Fuels uh, purchased uh, the site from Cumberland Farms, and at that point, PMG leased the site from uh, Blue Hill Fuels. And then this past January 2020, 
uh, my client PMG um, purchased the site outright from um, Blue Hill Fuels. So basically where we're at is PMG has um, uh, inherited a situation where, um, as you'll see in the uh, materials, um, we've inherited a site where Cumberland did not complete the work uh, which it was required to do under the order of conditions. Um, and so we have an open order uh, with no certificate of compliance. And the reason we're here is because my client PMG is now seeking to uh, add a drive-through to the rear of the uh, to the rear of the building. Um, and in doing so, they would they would stay under that 8,000 square foot alteration number. Um, the rear front regulations, sort of the main point of them is uh, make sure you improve conditions. And for the reasons that um, our engineer, Jesse Coakley, will explain in a minute, with your permission, um, we're definitely going to uh, propose to uh, in improve the conditions at the site. Um, why, why have we come here tonight? In order to build the drive-through, uh, we would need to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals um, for further use variances and further dimensional variances. Um, but before we did that, due to the sensitivity of work in the riverfront, we thought it made sense to check in with the Conservation Commission um, to understand your thoughts and, and reactions to the plan. Um, so if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask Jesse Coakley to walk through. We've got four or five slides to explain the project. Yes, go ahead. Jesse? Thank you, Brian. Thank you Chairman. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Jesse Coakley with Mazer Consulting, the engineer for the project. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and show you a couple of uh, PDFs that I'll, I'll describe for you, a couple of images. Can everybody see that? Yes. Great. So as Brian mentioned, this site is located at 160 Andover Street. Uh, it has additional frontage on Avalon Bay Drive on the left-hand side of the page here. So uh, this, hold on a second, please. Sure. I'm just trying to get my bearings. Okay, so I see Andover Street is at the top. Yes. And the other road that you mentioned is on the left? Yeah, it, on, this is the 2006 site plan. Okay. Um, it's called the Trailer Park Access Road here, but it's Avalon Bay Drive, and then 95 is further to the west here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then in the rear is Crane Brook at the bottom of the page. Okay. All right. So mm -hmm. the site as it is today has the canopy uh, with about five pump islands underneath, and then it has approximate 3,100 square foot convenience store with uh, with the Dunkin' Donuts inside as well. Um, the existing building is about 93 and a half feet from the rear property line, which um, is basically the center line of Crane Brook. Um, <clears throat> the red and blue lines that you see on the plan here, uh, the red area is the approximate 45,237 square foot of riverfront area, which is from Crane Brook to the 200 foot offset. The blue line represents <clears throat> from that 200 foot area, approximately the 37,561 square feet that was part of the 2006 um, application that was made, the NOI, of the degraded area. So the 37,000 square feet is between the blue line and the red line, heading south? Uh, heading north. So from the, from the top down to the blue, I think if I can't click yes. on it because it's flattened, but. <clears throat> So, okay, so that's all area that's been improved. So where's the result, the remaining 8,000 square feet? Right. So the next slide that I have here is from the same 2006 site plan, 
although this is the landscape plan and it called for um, a bunch of tree plantings to be made from basically behind the building up into you know the bank of crane brook however as brian stated earlier um it doesn't look like this area of trees was ever installed so that's where that open order still is exists so this was the 2006 plan the next image i have here is really like an aerial photograph of the site today so you can see andover is at the top again what's known as avalon bay drive is on the left hand side you have the gas pumps and then you have the convenience store and you can see there's this area here that is really just lawn no no plantings you can see where the edge of the vegetation is okay and where's the edge of the river so the river is down in this area here where yeah. the vegetation changes color okay okay so the next plan shows you um and i'll zoom in a little bit just so oops i'll go in a little bit here so same orientation, Andover is at the top of the page, Crane Brook is at the bottom here. I have the same area highlighted in red, that is the riverfront area. And then the area in blue is the previously uh, approved 37,000 degraded area. So what you can see on this plan, also shown with a purple outline, is the approximate area of disturbance that we would be seeking to do to install the drive through lane, which would come off of the driveway from Avalon Bay Drive, wrap around the back of the building to the pickup window, and then exit into the site. We would have to relocate the trash enclosure, so that's why there's some additional <clears throat> disturbance here. It is worth noting that that disturbance is within the previously degraded area, and also, right now, the edge of the drive aisle pretty much goes entirely within the lawn area and goes up to the edge of the vegetation. So it's really in that open area is where we would look to put this, this drive aisle. Um, in reviewing the 2006 plans, um, we realized there was an opportunity to provide some improvements, obviously, in the riverfront area here as we went in and made this uh, made this change. So we initially had put together um, just a sketch here, which is the same plan, but those um, outlines removed. But we were thinking of doing some curb breaks along the outside of the drive aisle and putting some water quality swales in and then a potential stormwater mitigation area also in the cleared area of the vegetation, the lawn area that exists today. Um, Right now at the site, there's just a single uh, water quality device manhole um, where the entire site drains to and then discharges, um, you know, back here in the, within the limit of the 35 foot um, buffer line. So <clears throat> just to, we did, we've also had actually some pretty good conversations with um, Ms. Pendergast leading up to this meeting um, I think Mr. Fields was on the line as well, where we kind of went through a couple other options and they provided some, some feedback as well um, with potentially installing some um, landscaping in between the drive aisle and the water quality swale to kind of help uh, keep the water quality swales function um, without it collecting debris and, you know, getting dirty. And obviously um, anything that we would do would come with a full operation and maintenance plan, um, you know, that the site operator would be required to upkeep these features to ensure that they are um, performing as, as intended. Um, and with that, that's kind of the summary of the proposed project. And as Brian mentioned, we kind of wanted to get the board's thoughts um, on that. Okay, I'm um, overall, and just speaking from myself as one member, I mean, it, it, it looks like, uh, you know, it, it would probably be an improvement over what's there, but 
I just need to be better educated on this whole uh, degraded area and, uh, you know, what are, what are your rights within, you know, the lot? You know, I don't quite get all the, uh, the square foot that was um, improved and is, you know, whatever's left uh, to be improved. So I, I just need to, to learn more. Um, that being said, I'm going to uh, see if anyone else has any other questions, and then we'll we'll proceed from there. Uh, so, Chelsea, I'll let you go first. So I don't have any questions, but if we were to like go any further with this, I would want a site visit because I'm like I'm looking at the site on Google Maps right now, and there's like some trees there. It doesn't quite look the same. It's hard for me to get a bead on like what it actually looks like, and I would want to actually see it in person. Um, and also, I I would echo what Peter said, where I'm not super familiar with, like, the minutia of uh, degraded land and, like, where restrictions lie and where, like, there's more leeway. Those are my thoughts. Okay. Uh, Ann? Um, the 8,000 square feet, that is where you're, that they didn't use prior to, that's the area that you're planning for the drive-through, is that correct? Did I so, understand that? Yeah, so that's that's not exactly what we're doing. We are um, redeveloping what was redeveloped, um, and that number, uh, the area that we're looking to improve is about 8,000 square feet, and we point that number out because it dovetails very nicely with what happened in 2006. Um, because as you'll see, when you look at the riverfront regulations, you're allowed to redevelop, uh, alter as it were, um, degraded area. And it just so happens that they didn't, uh, take advantage of roughly 8,000 square feet. Um, and this just so happens to be that number, but it, it just, it's a fact that sort of dovetails with what happened historically. Okay. Okay. I was wondering if it was the same or what you're explaining is that you can use that acreage that they didn't use because it was part of the um, degraded area. You, okay. you, you, um, the, the, tra um, the swale, would there be any, I don't know if this falls into any category or not, but insect issues? Because that's, um, you know, another waterway, so to speak. Yeah. We wouldn't look to design it. I know standing water is certainly a breeding ground for mosquitoes, um, but we would look to design it in accordance with the DEP regulations to to provide water quality benefits, which um, okay. also doesn't want to have. So I, we would be trying to keep, you know, a two percent slope in a grassed area. Usually, is is sufficient. Okay. Um, any plantings? I can't read some of the little teeny last words here. Would you have are you have any plantings in terms of improvement for the area, in terms of bushes, trees, or whatever? Yes, that would also be incorporated into this design. Um, I had mentioned one of them was probably like a shrub that would be adjacent to the mm -hmm. drive aisle, um, to that would be you know native, non-invasive, but also allow for the health and maintenance of the swale to be maintained. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Vanessa. So to install this drive through in the back of the building, do you need to cut down any of the trees that were planted previously? So if you look at the aerial here um our intention would be to kind of come off the drive the existing drive here so this one small i guess relatively new tree would probably have to be removed but we would certainly be amenable to uh replacing it in kind you know somewhere somewhere else on the site okay but in terms of like the previous mitigation plantings that were done you wouldn't be removing any of that it is not our intention to do that. One of the, you can kind of see on this plan, 
um, I'll, I'll actually go to this one. It's a little bit cleaner. There's less lines, but there's a, there's a gray line here that's called edge of vegetation. And that's really where we're looking to put the end of the dry vial now. Okay. But we have spoken with Ms. Pendergast and uh, Mr. Fields, and we're going to look into potentially um, making that a little narrower to ensure that we can fit the swale in without with minimizing any impact to that, you know, existing vegetation that's there. Okay. And um, question for you, Georgia. I thought you, I thought it was, if there was an outstanding order, a property couldn't be sold. They had to get a certificate of compliance before selling the property. Is that not true? Um, so it legally doesn't have to be required. I think it's up to that buyer to take on that risk of accepting that open permit. Um, yeah, so it's not a requirement for them to have that for the sale. Okay. All right. then, Go ahead, Vanessa. I just have one more thing. It's not really wetlands related, but more of a safety issue. But I noticed now, so if a worker is trying to take the trash out, they have to go walk across the drive through to take the trash out. And I'm not sure that seems the most safe. What we'll probably end up doing as part of this is putting um, a depressed curb here and a, uh, and a crosswalk to kind of alert any motorist that, you know, they should be yielding to pedestrians. And if we have to put a, you know, a stop sign or something to help control that, we would, we would do that as well. Okay. Um... I kind of echo what Peter said about just not knowing in all the ins and outs of um, redevelopment of degraded wetland areas. I need to know a little bit more, or riverfront areas. I need to know a little bit more about that. But that's, um, I think, all I have for questions right now. Okay. Uh, is Ken still around, or did he leave us? I don't see. Uh, there you are. Ken, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, how many additional cars are we going through there? So right now we have stacking for eight cars within the queue. Um, in terms of a traffic generation study, we haven't done that yet. Um, you know, we wanted to come to this commission first to get you know the thoughts on on this before we as brian said before we proceeded to planning and zoning and you know we will we will likely have to do a study uh for them at that time that's a very heavy trafficked area um it's very difficult to get in and out of there. i'm very familiar with the area it's uh, very difficult to drive through there one of the benefits is um, it already is a Dunkin Donuts and a convenience store. Um, this would just probably allow for quicker service uh, at the site as opposed to forcing people to stop and park and go inside. Um, so in that way, it will better serve the traffic that comes through. But increase in traffic. It's, it's tough to say, and I'm, I'm not the traffic engineer, and that is something that will have to be addressed, certainly, at, at, at any planning or zoning approval. Okay. Well, that's the only question I had. That's not really our jurisdiction. Uh, okay, just uh, for clarification, Georgia, before we proceed, um, obviously their original order of conditions has expired. Correct. So they would have to come to us with an NOI, right? To, uh, with a new order of conditions? Um, yes, they, uh, he's anticipating that. And Brian and I have kind of been working how to approach um, the scenario because a lot of this whole conversation is stemmed around there is some binding language in the existing order. So it sounds like that will either have to be amended before it's closed out. Um, but Brian, and you can speak to this, but their team is aware that the order should be closed out before the new notice. So. Um, they will be filing a certificate of compliance to close out that order. Okay, and is there something that needs to be done before that happens? Well, if we want, I think 
a portion of that initial discussion was happening tonight, and I think further down the line, Brian, at another meeting, when you guys potentially come to close out that order, um, if we want to talk about that binding condition. Um, so basically when Brian has been bringing up that there's still some of that degraded area to play with, we mentioned that because the existing order, like I had mentioned in the memo, notes that there can, the maximum amount of riverfront area has already been developed. But um, what Brian was discussing was that's actually not the case. And what we're seeing is that there is some um, degraded area to still improve. Um, so before they can file this new notice of intent, the commission needs to acknowledge and kind of um, amend that condition that's binding any work in the in the future. So the first step would be for the commission to close out the order and kind of acknowledge that and amend that binding condition. Okay, so they, they still have to come to us for a certificate of compliance then? Correct. Right, and personally, and I think I heard it from at least from Chelsea, I, I would like to you know, get more educated on this whole uh, degraded area. And I, I'd like to see this site in person. I, I understand that there's some limitations on site visits, but uh, I think it's worthwhile that we try to work within those to, to get to see this site. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, is your, what's your time horizon to this part? So if, if I could just, if I could back up for one second, uh, the, the, the time horizon is to try to move the permitting as quickly as we can. Um, and I, I'm hearing you loud and clear that you need to come up to speed on the riverfront um, degraded area provision. Um, I, I think we can take the, um, the picture off this, the screen here. Um, so I, if I could just talk to you for a minute about that, because that's why we're here tonight is to try to suss out a little bit how the commission feels about this. And I, I understand it's hard to do that until you wrap your head, head around the regs. But let me just expand on this a little bit. Um, the, the degraded area provision basically um, speaks to riverfront that was degraded at the time that the Wetland Protection Act regulations were created. So basically they look at uh, was the area degraded uh, August 7th, 1996, very specific date. And then they say, well, if there was an imperfect, impervious surface there, uh, pavement, top, uh, an absence of topsoil, et cetera, et cetera, it's a degraded area. So really the question that we have here is we've got a site which has been redeveloped three times and this would be the fourth and it wouldn't be a complete redo. Um, so it's not 1996, you know, it's, it's not totally degraded anymore. It's been improved. And, um, the question is whether, um, the commission will look at this and say, yes, this was a, this was a degraded area and we're going to allow them to, in a sense, modify the plan that Cumberland Farms uh, was doing in 2006. It's just putting in the drive-through instead of having the wetlands planting in, in the back and still maintain the within the limits of what's allowed in a redevelopment, which is redeveloping the entire degraded area, which wasn't done. So what I would ask the board, the commission to think about is this. Uh, sort of procedurally, um, one idea that I had was basically seeking to amend um, the order or modify the order of conditions uh, by by way of this drive-through, um, and then close everything out altogether under a new uh, amended order. And then the other way of doing it is to to close it out. Um, you're going to have to you would you would have to not that you're going to, but in order to close it out under the old order, you're going to have to you would have to make it some changes to the words in that. Uh, order, as George was explaining before, and then we'd come in with a whole new order. But it, it just it just seemed to me that it, it, it would logically make a lot more sense and make it easier if we could just amend, seek to amend the order um, and basically say, look, instead of grass behind there, we're putting in the drive-through, we're hitting all of the numbers, we're staying under the thresholds, um, and that would make it easier for the board to think of this 
as though it were degraded in 1996 and not sort of look at it today and say, well, there's lawn back there today, so we really can't think of it that way as degraded anymore. I think that's that's the question that you're going to think about when you go to read the regulations. I think the I've got a copy of the regulations in front of me. Yeah. With the definitions. Right. If, if that is helpful here. This is 1058 number five, where it's talking about the degradation. But it talk, let me read the definition that might help people here. Redevelopment means replacement, rehabilitation, or expansion of existing structures, improvement of existing roads, or reuse of degraded or previously developed area. A previously developed riverfront area contains area degraded prior to August 7th, 1996. So these are very, those are very specific things that we seem to match here. Work to redevelop previously developed riverfront areas shall conform to the following criteria, A through G. Okay, so in, in I can't hear you. Okay, reading this earlier, that I was trying to match up, and that was why I was asking you about the, the 8,000 feet. Because, um, because I don't do the math here. And Understood. yeah, the one to one and ratios, et cetera, that was where I stopped. It was like, okay, I don't understand <laughs> exactly what that means. Right. The, the description here um, seemed to match what you're trying to accomplish with this area. Um, as I say, I don't do the math. So that was where it was like, for me, that would be okay, you have to tell me. Uh, what 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 this means to me and to your project? Understood. Right. Okay. And I, I, don't, I, I hope that helps the other uh, folks here in terms of really. If you look at the regulations, I think we can see um, where the matchup is and the intent here: uh, removal of debris, grading topography, seeding and planting, et cetera. So that there's a lot of things that um, the project is intending to do. So that's my input there. Okay. Uh, back to Brian. Yeah, so so I was wondering, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, in, I want, obviously the board needs to get its feet under itself. And I was wondering if it would make sense for us to come back um, at your next uh, meeting again informally to continue the conversation after you had a chance to sort of dive into the regs a little bit and, and maybe you know drop by the site and and that way we could actually get some further feedback from the board whether they think this is this this permitting uh is is doable okay so i think what i'm hearing is uh we'd like to get out and see the site in the the in, in, the, in the interim and just uh, get our feel for what it looks like out there. Is that um, members of the board, are they all in agreement with that? Could everyone get there on their own? And if we did get there on our own, who would we ask to speak to when we went there? Um, <clears throat> Brian, yes. do you mind if I cut in here? I'm wondering, one, is it possible for you to roughly mark on the site where the drive through would be with either flags or um maybe some string or stake so that way whenever members go out there they can kind of visualize there on site where the drive through would be um because i think right now with where we are without with covid we we can't we have we can't have the whole group out there with your guys and our team um i don't know how realistic that is because it's such a heavy use site but if you were able to put kind of a rough estimate or even spray paint of the outline of the drive through peter do you think that would be help or that would be helpful for the commission considering we right. have yes, a lot of time. And you know, the second part of my question is, do, would we go there just on our own or will we ask for someone while we're there? And so, just, yeah, I, 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 I let, me, let me jump in. I, I, I think the site speaks, speaks for itself. Um, when you go there, you know, there's a natural break between the lawn and the trees that you're seeing in the, uh, from the aerial photograph. So um, I would have to ask Mazer Consulting whether it's even possible to get someone up there to, to do a staking or you know, a flag or whatever, but um, the, the client has no objection to you know, the, the, the commission members you know, going out there on their own and, 
and taking a look around, that's fine. Um, and, and, and I think it'll speak for itself, but I, I, I'll have to defer to, to Jesse about whether we can do any flagging. Yeah, that's something we can do or, you know, work with um, someone to mark it out for you, even if it's even if it's a spray paint thing, so you can kind of see the limits of the start and the end. Brian's right that right now, the end pretty much is like at the tree line, but I think if you see where it kind of cuts in and cuts back out, I think it could be helpful, so that that's, shouldn't be an issue. Okay, if you were to do that, uh, I'm not sure how long it will take you. Could you let Georgia know, and she possibly could send an email out to the board, and uh, we would, uh, you know, find some time to get out there and just take a look. Yeah, and we can provide you with, um, you know, the name of someone at the site just to let them know that you're there, and we'll let we will let them know that you all will be stopping by so that they don't, you know, see the yeah, stranger just walking I in the backyard. Just, yeah, just. Tell the uh, the person working in the store that you know Danvers Commission, Danvers Conservation Commission, and we could just go in and identify ourselves just so they know. That's fine. That's okay. I mean, if we uh, if we could try and do that in the next two weeks, uh, maybe we could talk about this further at the uh, the next meeting. And Georgia, would it be possible to pull these these regs together and just get us some sort of document that uh, we could look at and just get a little more familiar with this whole process? Uh, absolutely, yes. So for the next memo, uh, before then, I can do a write-up, kind of a 101. Um, and then specifically, if there's any more clarification I need from Brian, I can work with him. OK. All right, let's 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 have that as a goal, that we try to get out there within the next two weeks. And then um, we'll, we'll talk about this more at our, what's our next meeting, July 9th? Uh, yeah, so July 9th is the next meeting. We do have about three or four items on there, um, but we can add it for July 9th, of course. Can I ask one more question? Sure. So I think I'm starting to come to kind of an understanding of um, what's being requested. So would it be accurate to say that the, the open order of conditions that was never closed out um, they proposed to redevelop a certain amount of square footage of the site. There was 8,000 square feet that they didn't finish or complete the work on. That work was supposed to be mitigation planting. And now you're requesting to kind of transfer that 8,000 square feet that wasn't technically redeveloped into, instead of mitigation plantings, putting in a drive through So... The area that was not redeveloped, um, if we look, Jesse, if we put back up the very first slide. So Vanessa, if you look at the bottom of the site plan, between the blue line and the red line that is in the Crane Brook, okay, that was a degraded area that was not altered. That's that's that yeah that area there. That's that's the eight thousand. Okay. Now if we go to the next slide, uh, or else the the slide with the wetlands planting on it, Jesse. So it just so happens that that red area where we would be putting the drive through, it's, it's, it's gonna be a little less than the 8,000. It just so happens, the numbers match up. But the area that, that Cumberland Farms um, put the lawn in, they were supposed to put in something else, and they didn't. Um, so we're saying, okay, let's just switch it up, number one, and number two, in so doing, let's improve conditions with, with some, some serious water quality uh, uh, enhancement. Okay, just one quick comment there. Uh, right now, you're, that's pervious, that's grass, right? And you want to replace that with uh, a paved surface. That's correct. That's correct. And uh, as more or less as the trade-off, you're offering these uh, stormwater improvements. 
Correct. Is that correct. Okay, because uh, the net result is we have to be convinced that this project um, adds to the uh, the quality of the the resource area and doesn't uh, have a detrimental effect. Correct. If you can persuade us of that, uh, it, 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 it should be okay. Understood. Okay, I think we've got a plan. Okay, so uh, we're gonna, we as a board will wait to hear from Georgia that um, things are okay for us to go out there and, and take a peek at the area. And Georgia is gonna try and get us some documentation on this whole, um, uh, degraded uh, riverfront area improvement and hopefully we have all that together and we can get it on the agenda for the um, July 9th meeting. Understood. Thank is you very that, much. Uh, is that agreeable to everybody? Yeah. It is for you, Brian. It sounds like right now. Any members of the board have anything else to add? No. Okay, so we're good. Okay, good enough. We will see you in a couple of weeks. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, I'm going to kind of pass the ball over to Georgia on this. It just says a commission discussion. Yes. Yeah, we keep it vague. Right? <laughs> keep you guys on your toes, you know? If you understand. Yep. I, I'm sorry, I should have, but no one piped in to say there was any public comment on the, uh, the previous uh, agenda item. So, Dave, did you hear from anybody? Or yeah, No comment, Peter. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, Georgia, we'll, we'll go back to you then. All right, back to and me live from here, my basement. Um, <clears throat> so the commission discussion, this is kind of to piggyback off of um, the conversation you guys had um, at the last meeting, specifically about that 18 and that 22, um, and to expand upon that, kind of talking about the regulation specifically that the Danvers Conservation Commission has now, and also the bylaws, um, and updating those, because in the background, Dave and I have been working to update those, as well as some other regulatory bylaws for the town. Um, and David's actually made a quick PowerPoint overview of what we've been working on. Um, David, are you good to pull that up if you're ready? I am good. Um, if everybody's okay and with your permission, Mr. Chair, I can share my screen. Yes, you may. Can everybody see that? Yes. All right, so we're looking very official. I'm um, going to kick it off. I'm going to talk at you for a little bit uh, with the introduction from Georgia, and hopefully it's not too dull. But we thought it was um, time, given the last meeting, as Georgia said, to, to update you on the goings-on with what we've been doing and also everything else going on in town. So just titled this Potential Updates to Town Bylaws. Um, reasoning behind this is similar to what Georgia said, just to give you a run-through of what, what's been going on within the commission's own regulatory uh, books and then also outside of that. So I'll go through the updates that we've been discussing. Uh, I'll probably throw it to Georgia to talk about Conservation Commission bylaw specific updates that you may want to consider in the future, and then talk a little bit about where the commission fits in uh, in all this, and then happy to take questions. So for those who don't know, but I'm sure you all do, but for the benefit of those watching at home and maybe some of the newer members, um, bylaws really are the enabling uh, act for what you police. So in order to actually regulate anything at all, there needs to be some sort of bylaw in the books um, voted on by town meeting. So essentially, you know, you have a set of bylaws that spell out what it is you regulate. Regulations come in at the tail end of that to spell out the nitty gritty of how you're going to do that, what that all means, and what the commission's jurisdiction is in relation to how it's implemented. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, to speed through, on the planning, zoning, and the general land use side, the planning board just adopted a new set of zoning regulations. It's the first time they've had those. It was kind of spurred out of some of the downtown rezoning work that you may have heard about um, this past February. So the current configuration for the planning board is they now have, they operate under um, a set of zoning bylaws 
a set of subdivision regulations, which only governs governs subdivisions of land and a set of zoning regulations. So the zoning board of appeals also works within the zoning bylaw, but the other two books, the subdivision regulations and the zoning regulations are actually only for the, the planning board to operate under. So some of that's new. So we have some new bylaws, some new regulations for that board, um, but it's kind of dovetail into some of the things I talk about later on. So communities using the same or similar structure, I have about 12 here. Uh, some of these you may have heard of in your tenure in the Commonwealth, but these are by no means, this, is a, this isn't an exhaustive list, list. These are just some of the ones that I'm familiar with, uh, a few of them I've worked in, but uh, moving on from here. So as I just mentioned, in February of this year, town meeting uh, adopted four new sections of the zoning bylaw. So we were calling those character-based zoning districts. They're, they're all downtown and they all have to deal with redevelopment in Danvers Square and along the high street area, pretty much from Route 128 up to the intersection of Locust and Maple. So those included public amenity improvements, which some, some of which are open civic spaces, green spaces, or other outdoor amenity spaces. So adding, adding a little bit of, um, I guess you'd call it vegetative pop along the, the downtown corridor in addition to some redevelopment. And another part of that was um, TDR, which I've included here, but it's called transfer of development rights. So that would essentially allow folks who would have otherwise proposed a subdivision of land on parcels, essentially in the outskirts of town, to shift some of that density into the downtown core to allow it to be placed where there already is some density, where there's already some housing units and some retail options, and effectively put a conservation restriction on those parcels that could have otherwise been subdivided in residential zone one, two, or three. So our other single family zoning districts. I wanted to point that out because that does sort of fit in with some of the conservation commission's missions in terms of saving some wetland areas or uh, improving water quality based on effectively not grassed area and otherwise leaving it untouched. Um, we've also been working behind the scenes to, to modernize some sections of the zoning bylaw. So. There have been updates to the zoning bylaw periodically, but some of it is, it may not be original, but it's sure close to, to when zoning was enacted uh, in the mid fifties. So we're gonna be updating, hopefully some of the sections dealing with site plan approval, some of the definitions and some special permitting. So all that is to say that we're attempting to, in our office, the land use office, to more or less modernize a lot of the bylaws and regulations that we're dealing with. So there's been add-ons and some things have been updated, but we hope to, over the next few years, do a wholesale update to bring us more in line with modern standards for things like low uh, LID, low impact development, and um, more modern standards for stormwater. Uh, one thing I wanted to note that George has been particularly great about working on is the cluster subdivision special permit. So that also allows, if a person were to go forward with a subdivision, uh, a tightening up of that space, reducing frontage and reducing impervious surface. So it's not just effectively a clear cut parcel. It would actually allow some greenery and some more um, environmental features to be saved. So any questions about that, I'm happy to take them. I'll leave that for now. This is more just to update you on what is happening uh, outside of the commission. Uh, other town bylaws, we want to more or less modernize traffic rules and regulations. Um, wireless communication, which is under the purview of the electric, uh, the electric division, but we've been working with them. And then the stormwater bylaw. So we've been working pretty diligently with the engineering division to update the stormwater bylaw. Uh, I won't go too in depth on that right now, um, but needless to say, a lot of the stormwater stuff is related to the conservation stuff. So. Uh, as we get further into that, if you have questions um, down the road or any comments that uh, you may want to add, we're, we're happy to take those. So where does the Conservation Commission fit in in all this? We wanted to update you with what's going on, but also it does have some impacts, uh, this modernization to you. So currently you have a set of bylaws and regulations. The way the book is set up, it's a little confusing. I think it's actually titled wetlands bylaw regulations, but effectively it is to 
it's supposed to be two separate things. So very similar to the Wetlands Protection Act, which was authorized under MGL 131, Section 40. Uh, I note here, so that's the enabling legislation that effectively says what you regulate and what you can do. That's about 15 pages long. And then you have the CMR regulations, so 310, CMR 10. Those are the regulations for the act. So that's 246 pages long. So just for a little tidbit there, that, that's going to spell out what you're measuring, how you're measuring it, um, you know, what type of performance standards you need to meet, and, and all that good stuff. So that said, um, the regulations are, are binding so long as the commission adopts them. So if there's certain things you want to see as, in terms of performance standards and the way those are implemented or managed, uh, we could update the regulations for the commission to include a lot of that. I know one of the things that we've been discussing recently is updating to the Cornell rainfall standards as opposed to the traditional standards that we have now. Um, spelling that out specifically can be done in the regulations and um, is probably a good move for the commission going forward. But that being said, I'll, I'll throw to Georgia now to discuss anything she wants to about the, the uh, bylaw regulations information she's been working on for the commission. Yeah. Um, so I actually have a great example for a good change we're proposing in the regulation so and how that correlates so overall like david had just said in 310 310 cmr 10 they're basically there's that general 100 foot buffer zone off a resource area but in the town of danvers luckily we're one of those commissions that adopted our own bylaw buffer zone so that's where we get the opportunity to be more regulated than um, the state standards so in our bylaw, we could say we have a buffer zone of 25 and 35. And then in the regulations, that's where we go further in depth saying you can't have X, Y, and Z in the 35. So that's where we go into more details in the reg. Um, so in the bylaw, again, the bylaw we have now, it's not that it's a boilerplate bylaw, but if, if you Google a lot, not Google, but if you look at um, a lot of other towns, you'll see our same exact bylaw. Um, and not that there's anything wrong with it. it. It's great for the purpose it serves now, but there's definitely some areas we can expand upon. Um, and again, there are some towns that just have the 100 foot buffer and that's it. And they don't have a 25 or a 35. Um, that being said, their development's a little bit different. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. Um, from David. You guys should be good to see. So this is just a quick overview so you guys can just kind of read through. But um, so like I just said, right now we have the existing 25 no disturb and the 35 no build. Um, and just based on historic and previous, I think permits and applications we've had, we've had a lot of discussions about work going on in that 35. Um, and doing a lot, I think a lot of what David had also mentioned too, a lot of the changes we're making in these bylaws are based off research of what other towns have done and had success with um, and what state entities are kind of recommending and also what would fit best in town. So here you can see um, we're actually proposing to do away with the 25 no disturb and the 35 no build and actually change it to a 35 and a 50. Um, and with that comes a little bit more performance standards than what we have now. So what we see now is applicants kind of saying, yeah, I need to work in the 35 and I'm requesting a waiver for it. And then there's usually a good conversation that results from it. But with these new regs, this lays out strictly out front what the applicant needs to provide if they want to do any work within that um, 50 no bill. And then there's also um, provisions for situations similar to what we saw tonight in that there's existing structures within these new buffers we're making. So we'll add provisions for people to maintain existing structures within these buffers because we are making them a little bit um, bigger. Of course, we're gonna capture some more, more work and permitting, but again, we allow activities that aren't gonna alter as much to be allowed by, right? Um, and then a provision of that is if you are um, proven and you're allowed to build within that 50 no build, you can only alter 50% of the total no build. So there is kind of opportunity to build, but again, limiting that construction. Um, 
And then another big one that I've noticed in a lot of other communities similar to Danvers is the um, minor permits. So again, similar to the one we saw tonight, um, if we just had a single family home addition that met all that criteria, those four minor criteria, and it was outside of the 50, um, staff felt no need for them to have to come in front of the board if they met all those requirements. So kind of minimizing and streamlining the permitting. Um, but of course, we added some provisions that if staff felt it necessary to provide more information, we would ask for that. Um, and then some other bigger ones, again, increasing the waiver standards for people that did want to um, work in the 35 or the 50. And then also um, an addition was adding protection, more protection for vernal pools. Um, we don't see a lot of that in the commission right now. <clears throat> Um, a lot of the vernal pools in town are um, potential vernal pools, or there's really not a lot of activity around them. But we're not to say that that couldn't happen next year or in 50 years. So um, adding the provisions now just will help in the future. Um, and that kind of leads me to what I, I had written here. It says waterway provisions pending. Um, David and I are kind of discussing and researching what other towns have done define exactly where in the bylaw it's appropriate to put the, the waterfront regulations that we'll eventually discuss as a commission to put into the regulation. So where in the bylaw can we reference in the regulations that, that 18 inches or that 22 inches? Um, so those were just the, the bigger ones that I thought the commission would be interested in. And I think, of course, as we start adding more and once things get really buttoned up, we'll be looking to you guys for some solid feedback and review. Um, but that's all I had. If anyone had any questions or David, do you want to add anything? Um, I, I did just want to wrap it up just quickly. Thank you very much um, for giving that overview. Um, obviously to note bylaw changes of any type need to go to first the commission and then to the selectmen yeah. and then to town meeting. So uh, we're, we're not just cruising through this as staff, assuming that this is a, a given. Uh, also, the regulations need to be voted on by the commission and their, the commission's own uh, set of regulations. So that said, uh, we would like to share what we've been working on with you relatively soon. But um, at the staff level, it's it's been an idea pad that we've been trying to go through the, the document and plug things in. So we wanted to wait until we you had something to react to as opposed to just us throwing some ideas out at you. So just to put that out there, uh, sort of to close, I did want to say that part of the overall schema for the land use department is um, modernizing these bylaws and regulations that we have, as I said. But in that, we thought it would be useful, and I believe this has been done in the past, to bring together all of the regulatory boards that deal with um, land use and building buildings or structures. So the Historic District Commission or the Historic Preservation Commission most notably uh, for what we're calling a land use summit. Uh, like I said, that's that's been done in the past, but it would be really to discuss trends in development that are going on throughout town, what, what you all are seeing with the docks and piers coming in and other types of development related to what all of the other boards and commissions that, that we staff and that we don't staff uh, are seeing. So we're looking to, we were looking to put that together this summer, obviously, um, we have COVID, so that got put on pause, but we're hoping to either move forward with that virtually or get some sort of better uh, guidance from the state where maybe we can hold that earlier in the fall, but uh, yet to unfold, but stay tuned on, on that one. So again, I just threw up questions, happy to take them, but I'm gonna, I'll stop sharing my screen and, and comments or questions are welcome to Georgia or I. Thanks. I just had one quick question. I think I might have even heard the answer. But all of these proposed uh, changes to regulations to become part of the bylaw, the town meeting has to approve those as part of the zoning package. Is that right? So the zoning ones would be, would be approved for the zoning bylaw, but um, the Conservation Commission has its own set of bylaws. So bylaws would be approved by town meeting whereas regulations are approved simply by a board or commission generally. So okay. so for your regs, you guys can go in and tweak those. That's kind of why it's good to put like rainfall data calculations in the regs because as science develops, you can update those as opposed to going back to 
full town meeting to get them to vote on new rainfall data. Okay, so if we had, if I'm hearing you correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, if uh, you know uh, Georgia had uh, some proposed regulations around uh, the peers at our last meeting, we have the, uh, the authority to go in and just uh, add those to the bylaw? To the regulations. So yeah. the by okay. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Peter. No, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke, you're right. We, we could go in and add those to the regulations. Right, so the bylaw could say, you know, the Conservation Commission regulates docks and piers, full stop. But how you do that would be in the reg. So if you guys want to say floats have to be uh, 18 inches off the, the bottom, then then so be it. Um, if there's a waiver option for that to go lower, but has to be demonstrated why, that that's also spelled out in the regs. Oh, okay. So that's that gives us a little more latitude. Okay, that's uh, the only question I had. Does anyone else? I'm just going to... You know, speak up if you have any questions. But a comment, thank you. I mean, being alerted to what's happening throughout the town makes a difference to the rest of us, too. Thank you. Thanks, David. No problem. It was probably overdue. <laughs> yeah. no. it's, all, it's all a step in the process. We're, we're moving down the road. Uh, okay, anybody else? Uh, any public comments coming in? Haven't haven't seen any email. Not sure if we got any phone calls on no that. No phone calls. <laughs> Just crickets. Okay. okay, so moving on uh, for minutes. I did see minutes for March 26th, but I haven't seen anything for June 18th. Is that correct? Correct. So I have to um, just finish everything off. I haven't. I mean, I finished them. I have to review them before I pass them along. So I'll okay. have everything to you on Monday. Plenty of time to review by July 9th. Okay. Uh, that being said, has anyone uh, had a chance to review the minutes and uh, willing to offer a motion to accept them? I didn't have a chance to review them. I didn't see them in the packet. I didn't see no, them. No, there was a separate email. Uh, when did and, that go in? As I recall. Was it the same day, Georgia? I didn't email them out. If they weren't in the packet, that's my fault, and I'll have them up for the night. I thought I saw them. Okay, so I guess we're going uh, to we'll vote on both at the next meeting. Yes. Okay. Okay, okay uh, that being said, is there any other old or new business that we need to discuss? Um, no, just a little addition. I've been putting, I'm going to start putting on the agenda what's going to be pending for the next hearing. Um, just so you guys are aware. So the next meeting, we have four hearings um, so far, and that's an amendment request, um, a continuation of that ANRAD hearing all the way back from, I think, January or February, um, 22 Riverside, which is a continuation of a peer project, and then um, a new notice of intent for Harbor Street. Um, so I also am putting those on there, too, just so you guys know what's on the agenda if you wanted to do a drive-by. Um, or just take a peek at your own. I, I, if you wanted to go on the property, let me know so I can talk to the homeowners. That's but I think true. COVID, it's a little different. But if you wanted to do a drive-by, you're more than welcome to do those areas. What was the uh, the fourth one again, Georgia? Uh, the fourth one. one is a notice of intent at 28 Harbor Street that was just filed yesterday. Okay, 20 Harbor Street? 28 Harbor Street. That's right by uh, Pope's Landing. Okay. All right. All right. No, that's a good idea. It just uh, gives oh. us a little time to prepare a little bit more. And, yeah, nope, that's all for me. Okay, good. Uh, if anyone else have anything else? Uh, if not, uh, someone make a motion to adjourn? I make a motion that we adjourn the June 25th <laughs> meeting of the Conservation Committee. Is it the 25th? Yes, it is. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, uh, Vanessa, yes. you in favor? Yes. Chelsea? Yes. Anne? Yes. And Peter? Yes. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you all. And we'll...
be talking. Well, actually, we'll look forward to hearing from Georgia about when we get over to um, Andover Street, and we'll meet together as a group in two weeks.